At this time, I'd like to introduce our speaker here this evening. Dr. Marsha Chatlin is a distinguished associate professor of history and African American studies at Georgetown University. She is a leading public voice on the history of race, education, and food culture. The author of Southside Girls Growing Up in the Great Migration, Chatlin lives in Washington, DC. The book we are here for this evening is titled Franchise, The Golden Arches in Black America. The book has received glowing reviews from the New York Times, Kirkus Reviews, Library Journal, among many other outlets and authors. Um, and if you were here last week with Dr. Blight, uh, you heard this blurb already for Marsha's book, but it's so good, I'll read it again. Again, this is from Dr. David Blight. Franchise is a stunning story of post-1960s urban black America, a tale of triumph and good intentions, but also of tragic consequences for race relations, poverty, and dietary health. Marsha Chatlin has done superb research and writes as a great storyteller. This is an important book, and Chatlin makes us see black capitalism in all its mixed blessings. At this time, please join me in welcoming Dr. Marsha Chatlin to the stage. Thank you so much. Hi, folks. How's everyone doing? Good. Um, actually, can I remove that? Am I allowed to remove this? Perfect. All right. Um, well, I just want to say thank you so much to the folks at uh, Midtown Scholars Bookstore and folks in the Harrisburg community for coming out uh, to hear about Hi, how are you? This is so, I, you see people in the most unexpected places. What are you doing here? You moved here, good to see you. Um, so this is the best part of writing a book. Um, you get to see folks you haven't seen in a while, and you have an opportunity to tell the story behind the story. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about what motivated me to write a book about McDonald's and black America, and then I want us to have a conversation about fast food, about opportunity, and about civil rights. McDonald's is one of the few topics that I have ever ever written about that everyone has an opinion of, an experience of, or feelings about. Um, does anyone here not know what McDonald's is? <laughs> okay, so we're good. Um, has anyone here never eaten at a McDonald's? All right, one person. We'll tell you all about it, and we'll get you up to speed. Um, so why did I write a book about McDonald's and black America? People often ask me, what makes this relationship so special? Everyone around the world eats McDonald's. Most people have an experience of McDonald's. But when we look at the frame of African American history, we realize that McDonald's does not mean the same thing to all people in the same place, at all places. And what I mean by that is my exploration into McDonald's and the post-1968 climate in a lot of urban areas in America is a story about the limits of what business development can do as a strategy for advancing African American civil rights. And so I tell the story of McDonald's, not from the traditional vantage point in which people have often written about McDonald's, where they talk about the early days in Southern California, they talk about Ray Kroc and his incredible influence on the franchising system, they talk about McDonald's relationship to a global marketplace in which you can find McDonald's in most continents, not all, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and they often talk about McDonald's in relationship to African Americans in terms of a health crisis. People talk about fast food and diabetes and hypertension, but one question that I felt a lot of people weren't asking was, how did we get here? How did McDonald's become such a fixture in so many inner city communities? And what can that history help us better understand as we struggle with the consequences of health disparities as well as issues of food deserts? So I dove in. A few things about McDonald's McDonald's and black America. The first part of the story talks about the founding of McDonald's as reflective of the racial politics of our nation. 
The fact that the McDonald's brothers were able to grow up very poor in New Hampshire and take a chance on going into businesses in Southern California. First they started the movie industry, then they tried hot dogs, then they tried barbecue, they were so bad at it, and then they found that their real gold was in hamburgers. But the various opportunities that the McDonald's brothers were able to take advantage of and grow their business were predicated on some of our most racially incendiary policies of the 20th century. The fact that as white Americans, they were able to access bank loans to invest in new businesses and try and try again. The fact that fast food grew up with the highway system, a system that was responsible for the displacement of many African American communities. The fact that when they started to make a lot of money in San Bernardino, California, that part of California was built up because of suburbanization and because of new opportunities that opened up for white military uh, uh, workers as well as veterans. Uh, and many of those opportunities were granted at the exclusion of African-American veterans. So I tell the story of McDonald's in the 20th century through the lens of what we know about race in America. I also talk about the curious fact that when we think about the sit-in protests of the 1960s, we often think of companies that no longer exist. We know that we celebrated on February 1st the 60th anniversary of the Greensboro sit-in. And we know those iconic images from Woolworths. We know images from Katz's Drugs and Rexall. But how many people are aware that McDonald's was actually a target of sit-in protests by organizations like the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and the Congress of Racial Equality? They actually fought McDonald's segre segregation practices in the Deep South. So I talk about why we don't see McDonald's in that frame. And one of the reasons why I believe so is because of McDonald's entry into African American communities in the late 1960s, they wrote themselves out of an old civil rights narrative in which there was a fight to desegregate and they revised it to talk about being a socially progressive company. So how did McDonald's do that? Well, it all started in April of 1968, after Martin Luther King's assassination in Memphis, Tennessee. Many of you are aware that in some parts of the inner city, um, there were various uprisings in response to King's assassination. And what McDonald's observed in that process were that there were many white franchise owners who no longer wanted to do business in cities like Chicago and Detroit out of fear that they would be target of reprisal from the local community. So McDonald's came up with a solution. They said, if you are a white franchise owner in one of these predominantly African American communities and you no longer want to do business here, we'll send you to the suburbs and in your place we'll put in an African American franchise owner. And this was the beginning of the targeting of African Americans as franchise owners for McDonald's. And in these early days, these franchise owners were few, um, the founders of the National Black McDonald's Operators Association were largely in Midwestern cities. But in a very short period of time, they realized that they could be very successful at franchising because they were serving a rather captive audience. That after 1968, the number of white-owned businesses that fled the cities to go to the suburbs was... <sighs> What's the right word? I don't want to be dramatic. This is the thing that historians are always care. I was going to say it was monumental. I'll say it was very important um, to changing the economic landscape of the inner city. And so at the very moment that grocery stores are leaving, that small corner stores are leaving, that restaurants are leaving, the fast food industry is targeting the inner city. They're targeting these places for a number of reasons. One. The Nixon administration put many resources in promoting minority businesses through small business loans, through the Office of Minority Business Enterprise. The cost of doing business in the inner city 
also started to fall because real estate costs fell. And if you know anything about McDonald's, you know that it's a real estate company that offers hamburgers. McDonald's owns the real estate in which they build their stores. And so they were able to build more stores in these neighborhoods because the cost of land was lower. And then the third part is that they were capitalizing on an ideo ideological shift in civil rights. For a number of folks who had seen the great victories of the early 60s, the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the passage of the Voting Rights Act of 1965, by 1968 started to have a lot of questions about the direction of the nation. After King's assassination, many of his allies decided that perhaps the steps to use federal legislation to integrate schools, to secure fair housing, to give everyone an equal chance at the American dream, perhaps wasn't working. And that something that was visible and tangible for many communities was business. So a number of folks lined up behind the idea of black capitalism as the next step in civil rights. So all of these seemingly disparate issues came together at the very moment that McDonald's was starting to rethink its concentration in the suburbs and move to the inner city. And so within a very short period of time, between 1968 and about 1975, McDonald's discovered the African-American consumer market. And they were able to invest a lot of resources in the recruiting of black franchise owners, in advertising, targeting the African-American community, and in alignment with certain members of the civil rights establishment to bring more franchise opportunities to the inner city. Now, as a historian, I never, um, I always say that I have the definitive answer to this question, but this is one that I still struggle with. Many people ask me, was this good or bad? And I often say, well, let's take a bigger look at this. Um, this was complicated because on one hand, for those who were able to profit from franchising, they saw themselves as as extending this incredible opportunity to their communities. In communities that had lost resources through the decline in support for the war on poverty, they were able to create youth jobs where youth job programs were being cut. For communities in which there was little state funding for extracurricular sports and programming for schools, franchise owners who had become very wealthy through McDonald's were able to lend their support. African American franchise owners are often credited with bringing black women into work in McDonald's restaurants after the McDonald's brothers and Ray Kroc had created a practice of not hiring women in stores. They were able to extend employment opportunities to young women. For many of these franchise owners, they were carrying the mantle that had long been the responsibility of African American business people in communities to do more than just conduct business, but to ensure that their communities had the things that they needed. And so as the story progresses from the late 60s into the 70s into the 1980s, I talk about these critical shifts that move from franchising as a potential for some community economic development to a cause of social concern. And some of the concerns that McDonald's faced when they entered communities was the deep desire on the part of local people to hold McDonald's accountable for their practices in terms of wages, to ask questions about, is this really a black owned business if it is a franchise? How do we make sure that McDonald's continues to support our communities? So I talk about various conflicts involving McDonald's. In Cleveland in the late 1960s, an activist group called Operation Black Unity brings McDonald's to its knees in a community wide boycott and it involves uh, the first African-American mayor of Cleveland, Carl Stokes, who has to get in the middle of this because the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times are writing articles about a burger battle in Cleveland. The amount of puns that come out of this book are incredible. I tried to be restrained in the writing of it, but there's all sorts of jokes about Carl Stokes stumbling over a cheeseburger on his bid for re-election. I talk about the Black Panther Party of Portland, Oregon, that allegedly, 
bombed a McDonald's in retaliation for their lack of support for the free breakfast program. I talk about communities in Philadelphia that organize against McDonald's because they believe that there are other resources that their community needs more than another drive through restaurant. So I talk about this long history of both accommodation and resistance to the presence of fast food in black neighborhoods. Into the 1980s, an important turning point for the saturation of fast food in black communities involves the NAACP, which had struggled as an organization in the 1970s because they were being sued by a lot of the organizations that they had protested in the 1960s. So the 1970s and 80s created a lot of financial stress for the NAACP, so they start participating in a series of battles between African-American franchise owners and McDonald's. And what's interesting throughout this book is that the language of franchising mirrors a lot of the language that we use around real estate discrimination. For instance, in the 1980s, an African-American franchise owner in Los Angeles named Charles Griffiths claims that McDonald's is involved in redlining. And what he means by that is he says that McDonald's will not allow black franchise owners to own businesses in white neighborhoods. And therefore, he is being redlined into only working in black communities. And McDonald's counters and says, well, shouldn't you be proud to work in your community? And he says, I'm a millionaire. I live in Bel Air. That is my community. And it really creates this dilemma about how do you support the expansion of black business after a person becomes quite successful. And these battles are mediated by the NAACP, which helps broker a series of deals that creates more fast food franchising opportunities in the inner city. And as we approach the 1990s, you start to see the phenomenon today that people are concerned about. What does it mean when a community has so many fast food options and fewer and fewer grocery stores and fewer or fewer entry points for small businesses to compete? And the responsibility of the mainstream civil rights organizations in this process is very uncomfortable in terms of our understandings of what a civil rights organization organization does and does not do. And finally, and because I want to open up to all these questions because everyone's probably very hungry and thinking about McDonald's, um, <laughs> I focus on um, a story that I call the, myth, the miracle of the golden arches. And that is the fact that after the Los Angeles uprisings in 1992, McDonald's sent out a press release and they said, during the uprising, none of our stores were hit. And that was a result of our socially progressive and conscious activities since the late 1960s. And this story has been repeated by many people in um, classes about corporate social responsibility. Sometimes you see it in books about case studies, about why you invest in communities. And when I first read that claim, I thought it was the strangest thing that I had ever read. How can you, and this is something historians always struggle with, how do you prove why something didn't happen versus chronicling why something did happen? Can McDonald's say, with certainty, that no one attacked any of their restaurants because they had black franchise owners? or because they felt a special affinity to McDonald's. For those of us who remember 1992, we know that Los Angeles descended in chaos because of the reaction to police brutality in the city. How do we get to those types of narratives? And in the process of trying to uncover whether it was true or false, I realized that it was actually not important. The fact that a fast food company could suggest that it had that kind of power over a community in a time of great um, concern and a time of great upheaval was the most important part of how corporations suggest that they know and understand and are aligned with communities. And so in this process of thinking about the bookend of 1968 and 1992, I thought a lot about what does it mean for a corporation, what does it mean for the fast food industry to cultivate a relationship with African Americans, and how do they talk about it in ways that can provide us an opportunity to be more thoughtful when we perhaps are moved to judge people's food choices, 
the ways that they feed their families, and the types of opportunities that communities capitalize upon. In the process of doing the research for the book, um, in 2014, the uprisings in Ferguson happened. And one of the things I also thought was particularly illuminating is that in all of the cable news coverage of the uprising in Ferguson, a lot of the action centered on a McDonald's on Florescent Avenue in Ferguson, Missouri. And that's actually where the book begins. And the Ferguson McDonald's became another way, a prism of understanding the complicated dynamics of race and opportunity in America. That McDonald's is actually franchised by an African American named Jimmy Williams, whose father was the first black mayor of East St. Louis, Illinois. The McDonald's is one of the few businesses that remained open during the uprising. It was the site of a lot of the National Guard duty exchanges as well as police shift changes. It was where protesters went to seek milk after they had been tear gassed during protest. It was a place where journalists uploaded stories because it had consistent Wi-Fi so that they could continue reporting. And it was also where two journalists were arrested when they refused um, the police order to vacate the franchise even though it was still open. And so the chaos that surrounded that McDonald's and the chaos that brought McDonald's into African American communities and the chaos that is created by limited economic opportunities like fast food work and the chaos that's created by unhealthy foods in many ways came together in this thing that I was watching on television. And so I want to just end the overview of the book there to really open up um, for questions and comments and concerns about what we talk about when we talk about fast food and who we are imagining as having the power to change the impact of fast food on communities. Thank you. If you have a question, feel free to raise your hand and I'll come around with the mic. We're going to start over here. Um, the character of McDonald, I, I could be wrong. I'm just, just a basic question. Um, was that an offset of a minstrel or something? I thought I. Um, no. So Ronald McD but this is an interesting question. So Ronald McDonald, the character, um, was developed um, by um, uh, the guy who used to do the weather on the Today Show. Um, and he would, if you turned 100, he says happy birthday to you. Willard Scott. Um, I think it was originated by a local advertising company in Washington, DC, and Willard Scott played the character. But I do think the point that you raise is an important one in terms of the characters that are often associated with food brands are sometimes evocative of the minstrel tradition in American history. One very good example from the restaurant industry is there used to be a restaurant called Sambo's um, that was, I believe, acquired by Denny's and changed their names. But I think Sambo's, there was a Sambo's in operation in Santa Barbara maybe until the late 1990s. You also see an example of this with um, the creation of the Aunt Jemima character for, um, for the Pancake Company and the live action Aunt Jemimas that used to travel to not only World's Fair, but there was a restaurant in Disney that also had this. And so um, while Ronald McDonald was created to be a clown to make McDonald's more attractive to to children, some of the issues that you raise um, can be found in other places. Although I talk about in the book that when McDonald's wanted to do a deep market saturation in the black community, they struggled with Ronald McDonald because black children didn't like him. They thought it was weird. And so they were trying to think of different strategies to make Ronald McDonald cool. Um, and they didn't hit pay dirt, I think, with it until the 1980s when they had Ronald McDonald breakdancing. Break For those of you a certain age, you might remember these commercials. They used to have a breakdancing Ronald McDonald, and they got a little bit better at it. But he was always a, a kind of a tough sell. To, to black youth. Hello, it's interesting that you mentioned about McDonald's beginning in San Bernardino, California, which is where I lived. And I can personally attest to you the community at that time, which was heavily military and also civilian uh, as well. And then uh, when you brought up uh, Ferguson Florissant, uh, I would. I lived there as well. Okay. Um, uh, a few years ago, I lived 
just south of uh, Ferguson, Florissant, and drove through there uh, to go to school in, uh, in uh, Florissant. Uh, and after that, I had an experience speaking with several people in uh, Wall Street who had said that, uh, uh, and th this is in my college days, who said that they had the credentials to own a franchise, a Burger King franchise, in the suburbs. They had the money, they were loaded, and they had the experience, but they couldn't get a franchise, a Burger King franchise, in the suburbs. And so a few years later, uh, I heard that uh, they had won the class action lawsuit against Burger King because Burger King discriminated against them for not awarding franchises to African Americans to own a franchise in, in the, uh, in the uh, suburbs as well. Uh, so I'm, you know, hearing and speaking, or hearing you speak about all of these experiences brings back memories uh, from my past as well. Um, in addition to that, one other thing about the, uh, uh, about the riots in, uh, in, the, in the 90s, the police intentionally did not enter into South Central LA or that yeah. particular area, which then uh, poured gasoline on all the riots as well because people didn't know where the next meal was, going, was going to come from. And that's why they broke into stores in order to, uh, in order to uh, uh, get the, uh, the necessary nourishment that they would need for their families. Uh, but uh, yes, I can attest uh, to all those demographics that you had mentioned about the, uh, uh, about the racial uh, uh, demographics in both of those areas, uh, San Bernardino and also Ferguson Florissant. Well, what's, um, the point that you raised about the Burger King lawsuit, this is a common um, issue of contention across a lot of franchises about the awarding of franchises and locations. And Business Insider did a piece in December by Kate Taylor that talks about how um, the number of African-American franchise owners at McDonald's had declined over a 15-year period from about 300 to f fewer than, um, I think, maybe in the 210s, um, because people were leaving um, the franchise system not only because of allegations of assignment, but one of the things about franchising that I think you may or may not be familiar with, is that you assume all of the liabilities of running the business that um, the corporate head is removed from. And so since the 19, late 1960s, the reason why McDonald's had been such, um, had always been struggling with some of their African-American franchise owners is because they said, well, we have to pay higher security costs, we have to pay higher insurance, and we have to absorb all of that risk. And we're not allowed, even if we have the money and the credentials, to grow our portfolio. And so this has been a huge issue with McDonald's. Burger King, KFC had this issue also in the 1990s, and when groups like the NAACP would broker deals with these corporations about access to franchises, they would say, okay, we're going to open 50 more black-owned franchises in a five-year period. The people who had access to the kind of resources you would need to meet that demand would be people who are already very wealthy. And this is where you start to see a lot of professional athletes acquire 10 franchises you know, overnight in their portfolio. And so the idea of franchising as helping a person who was doing well financially and moving up economically became more and more difficult to see. I think there's a, like, you, you, well, yeah, you're in charge. Them. You kind of foreshadowed my question. Uh -huh. I wondered if your story is unique to McDonald's or whether it's typical of the social progression throughout the decades and a company trying to make money, trying to adapt to that as they still make a profit for their shareholders. So McDonald's is distinct in the story in the fact that they're the first and they perfected the form. Um, so one of the things I find fascinating, and when I write my 10 volume set on the history of fast food franchising, is the number of fast food restaurants that had multiple locations and then in a bad year, a bad acquisition, a bad transfer, they're gone. So it's Burger Chef, um, you know, Chicken Delight, they're these, these companies that were actually really viable and then they were gone. Um, McDonald's, I think, is distinct in that it was the first to understand market, market segmentation in the way that it did, while 
advertising to African Americans has a long history in the early 20th century. The ways that McDonald's did this, not only in just their advertising, but their ability to ally themselves with civil rights organizations for the purpose of expanding their business, I think was really distinct. And as soon as they did this, Burger King tried, Taco Bell, uh, KFC, but McDonald's was always a few steps ahead of the competition. I think Ray Kroc is fascinating because he was known to be incredibly rigid and obsessive about McDonald's. But the thing he understood is that you, you needed to be flexible in order to capitalize on the investment. And so there are these weird moments where he's incredibly flexible with what African-American franchise owners are doing because he understands that tolerating that flexibility will expand the marketplace. And he does this throughout the 70s in ways that are really surprising if you look at kind of his entire biography. Doctor, given the fact that uh, income inequality is a very prevalent issue in our society, in your research, have you come across uh, black franchise owners wishing to do better in terms of offering jobs, especially those in management to African Americans, people of color? And then on the second side, the uh, second part of that, have you found in your research that they have paid a little bit better than the minimum wage? So um, this, is, this is a great question. Um, the second question will help with the next question. I have yet to meet someone who says, I am paying more than the minimum wage because I understand the struggle of the working person. Um, the wage issue is important because um, under the Obama administration, the National Labor Relations Board made a statement that essentially told the franchise industry, you have to stop pretending that these businesses aren't yours. So the argument was, we can't raise the minimum wage because we aren't in charge of wages, the franchisees are in charge of wages. And so when a lot of the kind of Fight for 15 movement was getting some wage increases in localities, you know, the, dis the National Labor Relations Board said, wait a second, you can't pretend that these are not your businesses because you're a franchise. Um, this has been reversed in this administration. And so the idea that, um, that the franchise owner really does have to assume all of the liabilities becomes important for this community that I look at because African-American franchise owners very much so see themselves as an extension of a civil rights consciousness and they are capitalists. And so they will not necessarily say, I'm gonna raise wages because I know that this isn't a living wage. But what they will say is, if you look at all the businesses around, we're the ones who who will disregard someone's felony conviction record and give them a job. Or we are the person who will give someone a second or third chance because we know that these other businesses aren't. And so you start to see this really complicated way that I argue that anytime you try to use business, to adjudicate or mediate the burdens of racism and capitalism, it doesn't work. You, you can never fully do it, but there are these attempts to do something differently. And a lot of the ways that um, African-American franchise owners talk about their work is, you know, some will say that it's their ministry or some will say, this is what I do for my community. And they're within a system where they are also racially marginalized as well. And that's always, um, that was, the, I think, the most challenging part of this work to think about um, how do I write about aggrieved millionaires, right? Like, I, I was very, very conflicted reading about the NAACP standing up for millionaires who are getting marginalized. Did I really care that much? Aren't they doing kind of what the wealthy do, right? They use as many advocates as possible in order to mediate their problems. I don't know, mixed feelings about that. Yeah, hi. Um, question about the dietary impacts that McDonald had on the African American community. You kind of brought us up to the edge and you kind of stopped. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that. You talk about the, the capitalism and the investment and so forth, but what was the, you know, the nutritional impact that it's had upon the African American community? And in observation, I'm a native Washingtonian. I grew up in Washington, D.C., went to Howard University, but I don't recall seeing a lot of McDonald's in our neighborhoods. I mean, the problems we had were the liquor stores in the neighborhoods. So can you, your research, was it uh, in specific larger cities where you saw this dynamic? 
And if, if you did cover Washington, D.C., what were your observations there? Washington is interesting. Washington does not, especially in Northwest and the um, where Howard's located, there's one McDonald's across the street from campus. Um, there isn't the kind of hyper um, concentration in D.C. broadly of fast food like in other cities. And I think it's because it's a relatively small city. Also, very early on, um, there were two brothers who owned the territorial rights to McDonald's in that area. So um, D.C. is not a McDonald's heavy city. Um, but you know, the thing about the nutritional issue I think is important. You can't ignore that fast food has had some negative health um, consequences. But I think um, what's important to note is that when people are concerned about that, they often say, well, why aren't there supermarkets in communities? Well, one of the important things to know is that um, supermarkets are not small businesses, but fast food franchises are. So this kind of, especially in the late 60s, when you think about the government-backed programs and financing, it's easier to open up a franchise than a grocery store. Also, if you think about m the financial margins on grocery stores are very, very thin, fast food does a little bit better. Um, People in the 60s and 70s were not as concerned about the health consequences um, because that kind of public dialogue didn't really come into public consciousness until about C. Everett Koop and the Surgeons General after him, where people were concerned about these issues. Um, yes, it has an impact. Uh, I think it's important for us to keep that in mind, but I don't want us to ignore the fact that sometimes fast food is actually the practical, rational choice. That if you are working multiple jobs and need to eat something quickly, if you don't have a consistent source of refrigeration or um, gas to cook things or electricity to cook things, it's actually a very smart idea to eat something kind of cheap filled with fats, carbohydrates, and sugars to move on to the next thing. And the reason why I want to bring this up is because often I hear people who are concerned about nutrition say, well, don't people know? that kale is better than french fries for you? A lot of people may know that, um, but making kale and grabbing a burger may not seem like equivalent choices. Um, the thing that I do think is really interesting about people's anti-fast food perspectives, as early as the early 1970s, there was concern about the environment that they felt like McDonald's created a lot of trash in their neighborhoods and they were concerned about services to collect it and they were concerned about um, a noise and safety around with a lot of cars. And so in black communities that were resisting McDonald's, part of the argument that they were making was just because we're poor working class communities doesn't mean that we don't care about our quality of life, which I thought was a really powerful statement. Um, the liquor stores issue, I think, is also important. A lot of the liquor stores that saturate inner city communities aren't franchises per se, but they are often, um, they are sometimes created through um, store associations that are headed by immigrant communities. And that's important because those immigrant communities have sometimes created their own lending structures. Because a lot of the issues about what businesses go where are about access to capital. The reason why franchising was able to happen in so many inner city communities where people were not able to get bank loans or SBA, uh, Small Business Administration funding, but the capital of the franchise industry would step in and either negotiate those loans or do the loans themselves. So for African Americans who wanted to do business but maybe couldn't afford the franchise fee in 1972, McDonald's could waive that fee or they could compel local banks to make those loans. In similar ways, liquor stores and sometimes convenience stores, the capital for those investments are done by these kind of private networks that are closed off. And so there's a great book for someone, not me, to write about the relationship between the fast food industry coming in and then some opportunities in terms of bank lending. You, uh, you have mentioned several times about this being a history, yet you posed some why questions that sound more like sociology questions or economic questions. So could you talk about 
the relationship and how you view that between history and other uh, disciplines? That's a great question. Thank you for that question. Um, I rarely get method questions like this. Um, my training is actually in American studies, so my PhD was interdisciplinary in nature, and I think that is animated in my writing of history because I try to think about how fast food is this reality that people see through these different lenses. And so in my work in this book, um, I was reading a little bit of economic theory from people who are reflecting on black capitalism. Um, there's a lot of material culture that comes out of the fast food industry that I really enjoyed analyzing. Um, and then in the early process of researching this book, I read a lot of people in public health and sociology who were thinking about food deserts and food choices and realizing that they had ignored history altogether. That a lot of their research starts the day that someone buys a hamburger and never asks the question, well, how did this restaurant get in someone's community, or how did this hyper-concentration happen? And that was always my concern, um, the amount of public health or sociological texts that don't tell the story of how fast food got into the inner city, and therefore, I think it creates an assumption that there's a natural affinity, or there is something about one population where they're drawn to certain foods and others aren't, which is just not true, right? Every type of consumer behavior we engage in, we have to be instructed and sometimes manipulated and sometimes seduced and coerced into engaging in it. And I thought that that was just a big kind of glaring um, absence in that kind of literature. This is very interesting, uh, and my question was somewhat like Richard's, uh, but I'd like to go at it a little differently. Uh, you come with a, an eclectic interest of disciplines. Uh, it's as if you solved an equation here and X turned out to be McDonald's. Mm -hmm. uh, how did you specifically be going through all these interests of yours and say, there's a story. I, I don't want to ask the simplistic story, uh, question, oh, how did you get your yeah, idea? Yeah. But I want to know how you solved the equation and said X is McDonald's. And then I have another question, if I may. Uh, I work with a lot of people in China, and you can tell a whole McDonald's story, Kentucky Fried Chicken story, and so forth about China. But you opened my eyes about the Southern California and, and how a McDonald's uh, was there. Uh, the rest of the United States, uh, if you have a moment to say, here's how it was different from the North, from the South, mm -hmm. uh, from the Midwest uh, to the Southwest, whatever. So two questions. How did you solve for X and what about the rest of the country. Thank you. So initially, I wanted to write a book about um, fast food and civil rights. And the reason why I was interested in that is that, and now that I tell you, you're going to notice this. Every time I wrote a book, I, I read a book about someone reflecting on their experience in the civil rights movement, different types of memoirs, there's always a scene in a restaurant, whether it's a refusal of service or someone um, being abused in a sit-in or someone going to an integrated restaurant and that really having an impression on, on them. I thought that was really fascinated how this becomes um, a common thread regardless of the person's kind of political work. Um, John Lewis came and gave a speech at, uh, at Georgetown and he said, um, I remember coming to DC from Alabama for the March on Washington and eating in a Chinese restaurant. And it was something I could never imagine, right, in Alabama. Of all the things that John Lewis could tell us, he remembers that, right? And that really, there was something deeply poignant about it because when I interviewed people about their experiences of McDonald's, people of a certain age, African Americans, they remember the first time they went to McDonald's because it was one of the first restaurants they were able to go to without fear of intimidation or lack of respect or refusal of service. And I wanted to celebrate these moments in which people felt like they were included in a larger kind of sense of citizenship, even if it was just consumer citizenship. So all of this is to say that I was going to write this book about experiments with um, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and some agricultural food programs. I was just going to do this book. 
and I would talk to people at the book and they found the book very boring <laughs> um, because there wasn't much there there. It was just like, this is kind of interesting. This is kind of interesting. And for many historians, that's where you start. You start with a bunch of anecdotes that have no analytic thread. But when I talked about um, the role of McDonald's advertising to African-Americans and I talked about franchising broadly, people said, well, that's kind of an interesting story because I don't think... I would have ever noticed that. And then I took a step back and I realized I was writing a book about American capitalism and race. And McDonald's was the perfect way to do that because nothing, I, I couldn't think of a better way to talk about these two impulses in America and how they've changed over um, 50 years. And so that's how I did that. Um, your second question about regionalism, I think is really a great one because so much of the fast food industry in my research is tied to Southern California's um, place as um, the site of endless opportunity, uh, free market Christian evangelicism. So businesses like um, In-N-Out, um, Carl's Jr., uh, McDonald's, it's a, it's a kind of, um, uh, Nixon era, Reagan era sensibility about markets and about opportunity. And so when you think about people who are really drawn to those ideologies, then having to engage in the question of race, the way that they see it is similar to the ways that Cold War liberals see it. It's about just expanding opportunity. If everyone has access to a franchise, we're all fine, right? We're not though, but that's what they thought. We were all fine. And so there's something that's so deeply California about that sensibility. And the way that they were able to use their wealth to influence politics, I think, is really important. Um, as fast food kind of travels around the country, Ray Kroc brings it to the Midwest. And he is able to capitalize on um, a class of people in the Midwest who are a little fiscally conservative, a little maybe less risky than his Western counterparts. And so he designs a franchise for them. When fast food goes into the inner cities, they are really capitalizing on the fact that there are people who have been able to become locally important in cities like Chicago, Kansas City. They're locals who really have a lot of connection to their community who are able to be the first black franchise owners. Um, for African Americans in the South, franchise ownership is a challenge because when a new franchise owner becomes part of a city's local system, the other franchise owners tend to like meet the person and see what happens. For a number of African Americans who move to predominantly white franchise markets or into the South, they talk about having a lot of trouble with their new neighbors. Um, there is a rumor that is circulated in Cleveland that a man is killed because he's trying to break into a predominantly white territory of franchise owners. There are a lot of people who talk about having threats to their safety as a result of trying to enter these markets. So again, it mirrors a lot of the tactics that are used in residential segregation, which I thought was really fascinating. The idea of where people belong, using intimidation to try to keep people out, and then a redlining structure that doesn't make certain types of housing available. You see very similar things in the franchise industry because Back to the values question, um, in the early days of franchising, the franchise owner was not allowed to have another job, and that person, usually male, had to be in the store, and people had to know who he was. And so all of those factors um, really do influence how fast food franchising expands. The last thing I'm going to say is that um, there was a time that, depending on how affluent your community is, was, you didn't have McDonald's. Um, Manhattan res resisted McDonald's for a very long time. And then when it came into Manhattan, I think Harlem was the first place to have a McDonald's. Um, West Palm Beach did not have McDonald's for a long time. I don't think Martha's Vineyard has McDonald's still. They had organized against McDonald's. So it used to be a sign of affluence. Now, most affluent communities have lost that battle. But you can tell how rich a community is based on how distinct their McDonald's is. So if their McDonald's looks like a ski chalet, or it doesn't use red or orange, has muted tones, it's because that local community at least was strong enough to determine what that McDonald's looks like. I'm sure in Pennsylvania there's some examples of this, right? Um, so this is that kind of outward sign. And so resistance to McDonald's, I think, also had very distinct local flavor. Question in the back. Um, so, so two questions. Number one is um, 
With regards to the African American community now and franchisees, what are the numbers now? They've dropped dramatically? Are they flatlined? And then secondly, with regards to the Hispanic community, I see this model going over again, mm -hmm. where it was in using an African American community, and now being in Washington, D.C., I travel quite a bit. You see in the Hispanic communities, you sort of see the same thing. You see the, the franchises with mm -hmm. the Hispanic ownership and also staff. The correlation there, just by accident, or that's a, uh, it, a directive, that's what the plan they were trying to do? Yeah, so um, the, the, black, the National Black McDonald's Operators Association, I think their numbers, um, I think they're in the like two teens in terms of franchise owners. And at the height, I think they were almost close to 300. So again, it's not tons of people, but it's a very small group of very wealthy, connected African-Americans. Um, soon after um, McDonald's initiative in African-American communities took off, they started to try to recruit Latinos into franchising, especially in California. And so you see um, a national um, uh, Hispanic McDonald's Operators Association, and then you also see one for the Asian American Pacific Islander community. And so some of the similar things are being used, um, strategies in terms of recruitment. What is interesting that I didn't write about in the book, but I hope to write about in the future, are the different strategies that McDonald's used to talk to different consumers of color. So the McDonald's advertising ads, initially the message was, we're the only things kind of in your community left, was kind of the undertone. The tagline for some of that work was, um, um, uh, so good to have around. And the indication was like McDonald's is here, a lot of businesses have left, a lot of resources aren't here, but McDonald's is here, still here to be around. Um, when McDonald's concentrated on their Latino initiative, they partnered with the National Council of La Raza. And what they did was they did a celebration of heritage strategy. And so they created these tray liners that had uh, English and Spanish on them. They helped produce a series of videos that I think were shown on PBS stations about great Latinos in history. They really took this either this idea of culture and pride, and they led with that. Um, McDonald's did a lot of cultural work, and I talk about their support very early on of the Martin Luther King holiday, but that came from the franchise owners more from the cor than the corporation. But in their attempts to reach the Latino market, they espoused um, assumptions about where their values were as consumers. It's really interesting to see all the franchise, um, the big franchise fast food companies have done similar work. We have time for maybe one or two more questions. I was just wondering if uh, you got a chance to uh, think about uh, uh, the symbolic uh, side of uh, uh, McDonald because internationally, uh, I went to France, uh, not, I mean, two years ago, and I saw uh, the way they serve the, you know, the McDonald's uh, food is completely different from yes. the way they do it here. I don't know if you got a chance to think about that aspect of the thing. And uh, also, uh, symbolically, if you go to some countries, McDonald is kind of a representation of the American presence. Mm -hmm. Have you thought about it? You know, I don't write about it too much in the book, but you're absolutely right. Um, if you've ever traveled abroad, the McDonald's is the food is better. Um, it looks nicer. You know, um, the, you, you might have actually be served on real plates and there's beer. Um, I think what you, with those differences um, are really reflective of the differences of the food supply and more stringent restrictions on what people eat in other parts of the world. So there's certain additives, there's certain types of foods that would are allowed to be sold in the US that are not allowed to be sold abroad, and that accounts for the difference. But also McDonald's understands globally, while it has symbolically this representation of the US and popular culture, in terms of the palate of people overseas, there, there's certain foods that they just would not eat. Um, 
And so you see that quality difference. Um, I did a little research at an unofficial McDonald's museum in San Bernardino, San Bernardino, California. I highly recommend you all visit it. It's some, it's just like some guy's house essentially with tons of stuff, but people from around the world will come and give him things. And they give him sometimes food containers from around the world. And you see the ways that McDonald's tries to adapt to a local vegetarian diet. You see the different um, sensibilities in what dessert it should, should be. You know, you see a sweet corn pie or a taro pie from Asia. Um, the other thing, the last thing I'm going to say about kind of globally, um, chicken is very important to the kind of global fast food market because it's one of those fast food products where there's no, there's fewer religious prohibitions against the eating of chicken. And so fried chicken and KFC, I think in some ways is more of a global leader in terms of what people actually consume, even though McDonald's has the brand identity of the US. And I know a guy who's working on a, a book about uh, KFC globally. And I think he told me that 25% of all chickens become KFC at some point around the world. It's amazing. This will be our final question. I was just wondering if you thought that the, when you say about the poor diet and if you try to say that that is perhaps blamed on McDonald's, is it not that in essence in the beginning McDonald's was meant to be kind of an occasional place or a treat, and as a, you know, not something that you had twice a day for seven days a week? And therefore that exacerbates the problem of the poor diet. Um, yes and no. This is an interesting thing that I learned about McDonald's. So many of us think like, oh, this was not meant for people to eat all the time. This is where we start to see the intersection of race in the marketplace. Um, the McDonald's brothers were doing pretty well. And they closed down their restaurant. And they started to think, how can we maximize the bottom line? So they used to have peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and tamales and all sorts of stuff on their menu. They said, no, no, no. Burgers, fries, and a drink. And when they did that, they became more efficient. And they also fired car hops. They tried to discourage teens from hanging out. And they wanted it to make it a family spot. But they also reduced the price of their goods. And I think they did that so people would come more often, because it was considered an accessible thing for the families in the bedroom communities around San Bernardino. So whether the intention was really to be occasional from their side, I don't know. I do think that people probably viewed it as something to eat occasionally. But I think that in reducing the prices and doing the marketing the way that they did, they were trying to get people to come more often. For African Americans, very early on in the market research, they found that people were using the restaurants pretty frequently and they wanted more of it. And so what they started to do was to do marketing campaigns that emphasize that McDonald's is open all day long. And then they tried to enhance the evening offerings by trying to create evening only foods to encourage people to come back for dinner. And so I think market behavior was, OK, maybe this is an occasional thing. But what also the last thing I'll say about this, this is really important, is during the oil embargoes in the 1970s, this is when McDonald's urban strategy really helped the company. Because what they found were consumers in the suburbs were not going to waste precious fuel to drive to McDonald's. And then they said, OK, this is a market that is going to see this as a treat. So what they did is they doubled down on their efforts in the urban market, opening more stores in African-American communities, boosting their target audience in those communities where people were less likely to have cars and could walk to their restaurants. Um, so I don't think that consumers saw McDonald's as something to eat all day, but I think McDonald's was trying to make sure that we saw it as something to eat all day. And then with the introduction of breakfast, that really helped kind of blow the lid on um, something to be enjoyed in moderation. Folks, thank you so much. I'll be signing books. This has been great. Thank you so much.